The human eye's dynamic range is incredible, being able to detect a single photon of light, or 10 billion. The human ear contains as many circuits as the telephone system of a large city. The king of Israel named Solomon wrote that the hearing ear and the seeing eye were both made by God. However, are we to believe him? Can we trust the Bible, especially since it's supposedly full of contradictions? It's my case that the Christian faith is not blind, so please listen with your ears, eyes, and heart open as this episode of Skeptic of Doubt covers the physical evidence mentioned in allegedly contradictory biblical accounts. Forensic science is the use of scientific methods or expertise to investigate crimes or examine evidence that might be presented in a court of law. Although I doubt you need a degree in forensic science to crack this case. There is another occurrence of a Florida man. This time, according to Miami News Times, a Florida man tries to pawn stolen jewelry at store managed by a woman whose home he just robbed. His name was Nathaniel Coleman and he had robbed a jewelry collection worth thousands of dollars. He thought he could get a big score with these jewels. However, he started showing the store manager the goods he was looking to sell. But then the woman realized that they were suspiciously identical to items from her own jewelry collection. Thinking quickly, Marilyn called the police and her husband and Coleman was arrested and police returned to the couple's home with the husband. The house had been ransacked and a back door had been forced open, confirming that indeed the items Coleman had tried to pawn were the manager's own. So besides being another interesting tale about the escapades of a Florida man, what this account shows us is the importance of physical evidence in a forensic investigation. Indeed, keeping note of physical evidence present in the biblical accounts can help resolve alleged contradictions. For instance, the Bible records the building of the Tower of Babel. This massive construction project was halted when God supernaturally intervened and separated humans into different linguistic groups. This account is mentioned in the 11th chapter of Genesis. However, skeptics state that the idea that there was only one language prior to Babel is contradicted by Genesis 10. How do we resolve this alleged discrepancy? The answer lies within the text itself. Genesis 10 verses 6 through 10 records that Nimrod, a famous hunter and the king of Shinar, was a third generation from Noah, and he began to rule at the Tower of Babel. Genesis 10 describes the splitting of the languages that occurred after the third generation from Noah, and Genesis 11 describes the backstory of the construction of the tower and the linguistic divide. So there's no contradiction here. Was the language divide at Babel as great as the divide that existed in the house of Jacob? Joseph's brothers were jealous of him, and so they sold him into slavery and forged phony physical evidence that would suggest that Joseph had died, breaking their father, Jacob's heart. Eventually, as the account goes, Joseph ends up becoming second in command in Egypt, from pauper to prince in other words. However, who was it that brought Joseph into Egypt? Skeptics charge that the Bible, on one hand, claims that it was the Midianites in Genesis 37-36, but on the other hand, that it was the Ishmaelites in Genesis 39-1. In this case, we find another example of the fallacy of the false dilemma. The Bible teaches that it was a group of Midianites that purchased Joseph. However, those Midianites were traveling with Ishmaelites, and thus, both groups 
brought Joseph to Egypt. As mentioned, Joseph eventually became second in command to the Pharaoh in Egypt. However, the Israelites did not remain prosperous in Egypt forever. Eventually, a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph rose to power and enslaved the Israelites. The Israelites, through a series of miraculous events, were eventually able to escape from the bondage of Egypt. They made it into the wilderness and the people of Israel received the law of God. However, this is another point of contention. The skeptics ask, who exactly was it that gave the law to Moses? Moses, in his own writing, states that after receiving the law, the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. In other words, Moses is stating that he received the tablets of the law from the Lord. However, the Apostle Paul states that the law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So, who was it? God or angels that gave the law to Moses. This is another example of the fallacy of bifurcation of the false dilemma. Because as we've already saw in another episode of Skeptic of Doubt, the angel of the Lord is God himself. This angel is Christ Jesus, the one mediator between God and man. So, these passages are not contradicting each other. And for our last look at physical evidence and Bible contradictions, we're going to be taking a look at the alleged contradiction involving the city of Ai. Skeptics contend that Joshua makes the claim that Ai was destroyed and Nehemiah contradicts this claim by stating that Ai still existed. So, does this city in question, does this physical evidence overturn the authenticity of the biblical accounts? As you've probably suspected, my answer is no. This is why. Book of Nehemiah occurs approximately 1,000 years after Joshua. Joshua 8.28 makes it clear that Joshua burnt down Ai and made it a heap forever, even a desolation unto this day. However, Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 32 mentions the men of Bethel and Ai, 120 and 3. Did Joshua's account lie when it said that Ai was made a heap forever? No. The Bible often uses the word forever to refer to things that have already ended because the word is actually describing a duration of time. For instance, Jonah records in Jonah chapter 2 verse 6 that he was in the belly of the beast, so to speak, forever. However, he was actually in there for three days and nights. In conclusion, these passages are referring to separate times, and the skeptic has employed the semantic range fallacy with the word forever. So these passages are not contradictory. Incidentally, now that the belly of the beast was brought up in the last section, Christ rode in on what is commonly regarded as a beast of burden in his triumphal entry at the beginning of the week before he was crucified. However, what was this beast that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on? Skeptics charge that Matthew's Gospel contradicts the Gospels of Mark, Luke, and John. Is this the case? All four Gospels make it clear that Christ Jesus rode triumphantly in on a young donkey or a colt. However, the only difference is that the Gospel of Matthew also mentions that there was another adult donkey that was present at the scene. However, as none of the other Gospels deny Matthew's affirmation concerning the adult donkey, these passages are not contradicting one another. And as I mentioned above, Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem marked the beginning of the week of his crucifixion. Eventually, the same Christ who was greeted with adoring cheers was subject to ridicule and scorn. Christ eventually had his clothing torn from him and he was mockingly adorned in a royal colored robe prior to sacrificing his life on the cross. Skeptics say the identity of those who put on this robe of Jesus is totally contradictory. Skeptics charge that Matthew 27 verses 27 through 28 say the soldiers of the governor Mark 15, 15 through 17 mentions soldiers. Luke 23, 11 says Herod and his soldiers. And John 19, 1 through 2, like Mark, mentions just the soldiers. There's no inconsistency in these passages. This is another example of improper textual analysis. All Gospels affirm that it was the soldiers who put the royal robe on Christ. However, Matthew and Luke mention the additional detail that the soldiers were acting under the authority of Herod, the governor. So there's no contradiction in the Gospels here. 
And for our final contradiction, we're going to be looking at the events that occurred after Christ had been garbed in the royal robe. Specifically, we'll be looking at an alleged contradiction about the gospel records on who carried Jesus' cross to Calvary. Skeptics charge that John, in his gospel, claims that Jesus carried his own cross. However, the other three gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all claim that Simon carried the cross. This is another false dilemma, as both Jesus and Simon carried the cross. Matthew 27, 32, Mark 15, 21, and Luke 23, 26 all indicate that Simon assisted Jesus in bringing the cross to Calvary. John does not mention this detail. However, because he does not deny the affirmation of the other three Gospels, these accounts are not contradictory. Christ Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to carry our cross? For one thing, it means to be like Simon and help somebody else carry their cross. The next episode of Skeptic of Doubt will outline ideas about how to use the material discussed in this series in service of others. If you keep in mind the things that we spoke about today, like the fact that physical evidence is important to note, that we need to be thoughtful about how we understand biblical words like forever and that Christ Jesus calls us to carry our cross, then you should be a skeptic. A skeptic with a whole new way of looking at doubt. When pressed from all sides with hostile questions about your faith, it might be possible that you may feel doubt. Rather than being ashamed or letting your faith slip away, why not doubt your doubt? Instead of being overwhelmed by doubt, why not question your questions and test your tests? Unbelief should be subject to the same level of scrutiny and investigation that faith is commonly put to. I encourage you to doubt your doubt, be a skeptic of doubt, and remember, the truth saves.